Then good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 11th iteration of the Data Talk sessions hosted by the European Data Portal and Support Center for Data Sharing team. Today, we're happy to be joined by two of the authors of the e-government benchmark 2020 report, Joachim Docher and Ruhl Heilit. I welcome you both to correct my pronunciation, as um, those are both not easy names. They'll be speaking to us about their research into the eGov report, and will be sharing insights that they have gathered throughout this process. So you, please be aware that this session is being recorded, and it will be published next Monday and uh, promoted on our EDP YouTube channel. To Jochem and to Rule, I give you both the floor. Thank you very much, Elina, and thank you very much for hosting us. I want to uh, do a quick correction on the name. <laughs> so, and a, a short introduction, perhaps. Um, so, Jochem Docher, um, as a consultant, and we did this research in the past year, um, and your pronunciation was already quite good. Thanks. Yeah, I can also introduce myself. My name is uh, Hul Highlight, so it's a little bit uh, difficult difficult with the last name, I can imagine, for non Dutch speakers. Uh, me and Jochem work for Capgemini and Vent, both in the policy research unit. Uh, public policy research unit and indeed we have been working on the this project for the last couple of years and the e-government benchmark has been running since 2012 and um, so now we've just published uh, a couple of months a couple of weeks ago the 2020 edition but the whole conception of the e-government benchmark is eventually to provide insight into the state of play of e-government and to promote uh, learning amongst uh, e-government policy makers and um, to improve this uh, the state of play for European citizens. Uh, we work in this process a lot with member states and their representatives. Currently, we have 36 countries that participate or that we research. Uh, we have intense contact with their representatives from the public uh, administrations, and uh, we work with mystery shoppers in those countries. And uh, those mystery shoppers evaluate the services like a regular citizen would do. Um, we really want to know how, um, if your neighbor in whatever country in the European Union wants to uh, attain a certain service digitally, how would it work for them? And does it work well? Where are the pain points and what can be improved? And especially want to promote learning from one country to another and to check how it evolves over time. Our method has been based on the priorities set by the uh, European Commission in different e-government action plans or the Talent Declaration, for example. Um, they guide our focus points for uh, the methodology. This methodology is based around a sort of kind of life event approach. Um, of course, there are a lot of, oh, you can still go uh, back one slide. All right. Um, just to focus which services we evaluate. If you can imagine a public administration delivers a lot of services, but in order to uh, make a good storyline or to for us to be able to know what to evaluate, we have created eight life events. For example, uh, one regarding losing and finding a job, for example. So say I would be fired next week. Uh, what do I need to do? Where can I get the services? Um, and what is a logical flow for me to go through. Um, in that sense, you kind of scope um, a, a bite-sized chunk that is relevant to the user and also overseeable for the administration. Like I said, we do the data collection now in 36 countries. Um, so the EU 27 member states, but also yeah, the broader European area um, including, of course, Switzerland, Norway, uh, but also uh, Serbia, and, yeah, and also a lot of partner countries. Uh, so that also gives us a broad overview of to be able to draw a comparison between different countries and see which one performs well, which one performs a little bit less. For all the life events um, and all those countries, we sample over 13,000 websites. Uh, this is done in a biannual se uh, sequence. So we have eight live events in total. We do four one year and the four other in the next. 
So to keep to manage the workload and also to be able to see a progression. If you evaluate each website each year, uh, that's probably a bit too much to really be able to see an improvement. Um, so this is a, a nice balance between those. And we continuously evolve the methods, which is a very tricky balance because we want to be able to draw comparisons uh, over time. So the methodology can't change too much, but you also do need to take into account uh, changing priorities, but also changing technologies. For example, in the beginning, um, we were mostly focusing on services being online at all. Um, and thankfully that has been uh, a steady progress, but currently a lot of services are online and now you get more of the question, okay, how well are they set up? Are they available also through mobile devices? So the questions change over time, uh, which is in a way a good sense because that also means that the level of service provision is improving in a way. Uh, but we do want to make it that step better eventually. Um, I can give a short overview of how everything works and hangs together. So how we go from the policy priorities set by the European Commission to our eventual methods. The main three policy key points are user empowerment. So enabling European citizens to use services at their convenience um, and at their own time and pace. And to improve the digital single market. So also being able uh, for me from the Netherlands to uh, attain a service from Germany, from uh, Hungary, from Britain, uh, to be able to work across the European Union seamlessly. And we focus on preconditions, mostly in terms of techno technological implementations. So there are a couple of key enablers, we call them, that really um, empower citizens and enable uh, good service provision from government. For example, having a national EID or having an EID at all uh, enables a lot of additional functionality for citizens. So from these three policy priority areas, we have defined a lot of top level, uh, several top level benchmarks, which also flow down into a lot of in different indicators. Uh, one of, of a couple of which are, I think, especially interesting in terms of how public administrations deal with citizens' data. Um, for example, we added transparency of personal data as one of the uh, indicators in uh, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which really focuses on how well can citizens see what governments know about them and when it is used and what it is used for. Uh, you see that that is really becoming a higher priority to evaluate from our side. Um, it's not always at the best level or the highest level yet, but um, by measuring it, we can hopefully also recognize good practices and see the uh, ev evolution of the, that indicator. Might also be interesting uh, to mention that it does increase over time. So we are seeing a steady improvement uh, for transparency of personal data. And we especially saw an increase after the publication of the GDPR. So that was quite interesting. The GDPR was published and uh, uh, improvement, uh, the percentage improvement further increased. So that was interesting to see. Also uh, quite an interesting uh, indicator from an, a data standpoint is the authentic sources indicator, which is part of the uh, preconditions. With authentic sources, we mean uh, that citizens only need to uh, enter their information once. So that uh, as soon as you give the government certain information that you don't have to enter it time and time again. Uh, a good example of this sort of way to uh, use data is um, doing my income taxes. So uh, doing your income taxes can be quite an extensive procedure. Uh, I need my tax number. I need to know exactly how much I made last year and I need a number of other uh, points of information. And I need to do this uh, each year. And from that standpoint, it would be quite easy to if the, my government would already prefill a lot of that information. So uh, the tax authority already uh, sees how much money I make. They know my tax number. 
they know my name, where I live, etc. So with authentic sources, we intend to measure um, how a good governments are in um, assisting you entering your data. And this is a process of sharing data between government bodies. Um, also interesting to know, we have done an income tax pilot uh, a couple of years back, uh, where we want to see how much of the information is pre-filled. So pre-filling my name and my address is probably not the hardest thing to do. Uh, it becomes harder when you need information from different, different government bodies and when you have to bring it together uh, to one uh, well-delivered service. Um, so that's another way to look at uh, how you should actually deliver government services. Um, I think then the interesting part would of course be to see uh, how everyone scores. So to say it quickly, um, each year we see that Malta and Estonia are the best performers in our sample closely followed by Austria, Latvia, and Denmark. Uh, these countries actually have almost all services that we measure online. You can actually always log in with uh, an EID uh, and most of your data is pre-filled. So everything works in those countries. Uh, but luckily, um, so not everyone is already there, but we see that uh, the countries that are not there yet are improving and they're actually improving quite rapidly. So we, we have made a division between leaders and laggards and leaders are the uh, five best performing countries and then laggards are the five worst performing countries in Europe. And we see that the uh, countries that are currently scoring quite low are improving rapidly. Uh, and um, especially big improvements we see in Luxembourg and in Hungary. Uh, also interesting is that uh, countries that perform quite well are often relatively small countries that are well uh, technologically uh, evolved. And this is quite easy to understand because then you can deliver a lot of your services in a central way. So if we compare that with say Germany or with the UK, uh, these are also countries that are quite well developed in a technological sense, uh, but they also have to make services available to many countries. So that often means that each region or each city has to have their own website with their own uh, way of service delivery. That's all at a very high level. And we often see that uh, that is quite hard to make services available uh, in larger countries. Um, so I think actually in quite uh, three short slides, we have given a, a presentation and provided some explanation as to what we did. But since it's a, it's a data talks, of course, it would also be quite interesting to take some time now for uh, questions to specifically delve into a topic that are relevant to you as a data minded audience thank you for that smooth uh, transition Jochem. <laughs> then um, from that i open the floor also to the participants to unmute themselves and to ask questions and i can kick it off um, for the first one and that is you so this study has been running now for several years how has the methodology been um, updated in each iteration how have you used the feedback and the findings from the first round to improve it for the next? And the second part of that question is in changing the methodology, how do you still control, let's say, um, the impact it has on the scoring and the comparison to the previous years? So as you're changing different aspects, that can mean that some countries then respond differently as they would have the previous years, which changes how they are ranked in the system. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Sure. I give some short introduction. Um, yeah, of course. Like I said, we try to meet the policy priorities of the European Commission, Commission as closely as possible. They also update uh, their e-government action plan each three years, four years, something like that, um, which quite closely matches also our evaluation cycles. Um, like I said, we 
our methodology is applied in a biannual cycle. So each two years, we evaluate all life events and all services. So if you have a session of four years, that gives quite a good uh, time frame to look back and to see, okay, how did it go within this time frame? But also after each four years, it's a good moment for us to do some more uh, invasive uh, surgery to the methodology. Um, for example, we had some indicators initially included um, that were a little bit too vague or a little le less actionable, which were quite broad questions, for example, about the ease and speed of use, uh, which was very broadly interpretable, of course, by mystery shoppers. So we dropped that, for example, um, and we added mobile friendliness, uh, which became more important as people were using the web more through mobile devices instead of their desktops. Uh, which also required us to implement new methodologies. Before that, everything was done by the mystery shopping, but now we also do quite some analyses via automated tools. Um, but like you said, it does also change the scoring and how countries compare to each other. So that's also always quite tricky to keep that contained, but we try to approach that as much as possible by only changing the methodology or at least the scoring each four years. So we have a set time frame between you can compare, and then we go to the next cycle. And to add a bit on this, we do this in cooperation with the member states. So we hold workshops and then we uh, consider numerous options, uh, what could be changed. And actually, uh, at the start of this year, uh, we started a new iteration. So we had room for a new methodology update. So then we could actually look at things that are currently very relevant in e-government. So one example would be that there is a web accessibility directive from the European Commission, which is about uh, how to make people uh, with disabilities, how can you help them in using the internet? So how can, the, how can people who have a visual impairment still use uh, government services? Uh, that has just... Um, gone into use in August or in September. And now we are intending to measure uh, to what extent government websites uh, offer their services in an accessible way to everyone. So it's also looking at what, what kind of topics are uh, currently relevant in an e-government perspective. Okay, thank you. I open the floor to others who have questions. I saw a few videos turn on. I'm not sure if people want to jump in. I do have a follow-up question for the methodology. Yes, please, Ray. And then John Franco, you can go next. <laughs> um, the figure that we're seeing right now, the, the scoring, um, is that based on um, sort of if services are available, yes or no, or also the extent to which they are? And then how is that? Um, how is that rated sort of by, by the mystery shoppers? Yes, so um, the mystery shopper in, works in the following way. They receive a questionnaire from us with a number of government websites. So let's say uh, doing your income tax to stay close to that example. Then we first have found a website where you can do your taxes. Uh, then the mystery shopper has to pretend like he's doing his taxes. And then there are questions about is there information available and is the service available? But also a question about um, how do you authenticate online? Can you use your EID? Um, are there support options? Are there uh, fora where you can share your opinions? And all these sorts of questions, the mystery shopper has to answer yes or no. Uh, and that is then validated by the member states. And then the final score you see on the uh, last slide is actually the average of uh, all these indicators. So it's the total comparison of all uh, collected data that we have. So it's not only whether services are available, it's also are they transparent about how they work? Um, are they easily usable? Are they, uh, have they good technical technological implementations? Um, it's the whole spectrum of what we measure essentially. Okay, thank you. Next, John Franco. Then we'll go to Els. Um, I'm curious of, of many things, uh, Ru and Joachim. And you know me, of course, your colleagues. Uh, but 
We never really talked too much about your project, so I'm, I'm, I have so many questions for me now. The, the one <laughs> that, I, that, that triggers me the most at the moment in listening to, to your reporting about it is to what degree in your experience and from what you see in your study, you see the countries developing against these many dimensions in a way that is integrated. So I wonder to what degree we are smart enough to not just becoming great, perhaps at managing the identity of citizens on one side and great at making more web accessible uh, services on the other, but to actually see this as an integral experience and service to citizens. Do, do you see this happening? Do you think we should do more in that direction? What's your feeling? Um, if I could give my two cents, I think in general, it's quite a siloed approach. So either you see services from service provider A or the, a certain ministry improve uh, across the board, that it's just one of the administration that really puts a focus on it. Um, other times you see that uh, they, uh, the whole administration is focusing on one thing. So like, okay, this year we're going to focus on mobile friendliness or this year we're going to focus on uh, cyber security. Um, there are a couple of instances that they really overhaul their whole e-government uh, platform. Um, I know, uh, yeah, Macedonia did it, I think two years ago from uh, the top of my mind, uh, where they just take, took all uh, federal services and gave them a whole new uh, approach uh, just while we were doing the data collection. So that was, that was a little bit difficult. Um, but that's not like a, a frequent thing. Most improvements are still quite siloed, unfortunately. Why do you think it is so? Is it a matter of perhaps the technology fashion of the moment or, or perhaps guidance or directions coming from above? And, and to what degree Europe um, is pushing and can push so for this mm -hmm. to become an integrated approach? So I don't believe Europe can uh, really push in the uh, demanding sense. They can more uh, provide guidance. Um, and I think it's mostly a lack of cooperation. So there are a number of countries where you see uh, cooperation between countries, but also within countries that immediately provide better services to their citizens. So. An interesting example is in Hungary, where each little municipality had their own websites and all those websites were, um, well, not up to the current standards. And what Hungary did was to create one uh, e-municipality portal that includes all uh, Hungarian municipalities and it says, okay, we offer all these services here. We provide all uh, preconditions via this website. Uh, and in that way, they integrated actually all of the things we are measuring uh, for all of their cities in uh, one big project. So you can do it, but you, well, as rule said, it's often quite siloed and you have to uh, overcome those silos. And that seems to be quite a challenge in many countries. Yeah. And to close on this, I, I observed a similar kind of pattern from the open data perspective in the uh, national teams. So you can very uh, commonly find different solutions adopted by different ministries in the same countries. And uh, if if you want to, to play down to the basics, it may just be a matter of budget. So each ministry doing their own thing, not having even the opportunity to coordinate. To some degree, maybe a political element that is missing or a push for coordination. But all of this is useful. I, I hope it's useful for the rest of the audience as well. I'm sure we can do a little more, or at least to facilitate the process to be more coordinated across entities. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Then else? Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Very interesting, uh, very concise. Um, I have a question on the mystery shoppers. Um, how do you recruit and select them um, based on what criteria? And as you said that you also uh, assess um, the websites on uh, web accessibility criteria, do you include shoppers from that uh, specific target group? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of 
recruiting mystery shoppers, uh, we work together in a consortium with both IDC, SOGT, um, and Politecnico di Milano. Um, though Politecnico di Milano is mostly helping us in the data analysis. Uh, but uh, together with the other three, we have uh, like a, a pan European network um, via which we recruit the mystery shoppers. There are a couple of requirements we have for each mystery shopper. For example, it must be a net national citizen in order to be able to actually uh, try out the services or look how they work. Um, and those mystery shoppers get assigned the services and the URLs uh, we collect beforehand, and also some URLs to test from a different country. For example, our French mystery shopper could also get a service to evaluate in Germany whether or not he's, access, he's able to access it or not. Um, yeah. And we do have, uh, in each country, we have two mystery shoppers in order to have some uh, check, double check, uh, kind of four right principles. So we can at the end see, okay, is there a discrepancy between the two mystery shoppers and what could be the cause of that? Um, if there is anything that not uh, that, that they disagree about, we check further what could be, uh, what should be the answer for our evaluation. And to give a slight addition, uh, the mystery shopper also needs to have an uh, EID device. So uh, most countries have an EID, but we see that not in all countries, the EID is used as much as it could be. Uh, but to fully test the services, the mystery shopper needs to have such an EID. And um, to help them on their way, we uh, provide quite extensive briefings so to provide them with instructions, we also provide them an instruction guide. And so we train them, so to say, so that their um, results are comparable. And as a rule set, we use live events and with each live event, there's a persona. Uh, so the mystery shoppers have to think or act like they are the persona. So they don't have, they shouldn't be themselves, but they should be the persona that we have constructed to uh, get comparable and consistent answers. And instead of giving people a persona to play and uh, to step into their shoes, did you consider, or why don't you um, recruit people that are that persona, that are really from that user group? Um, that could be an option, I get, get the point. Um, so to give an example uh, of one of the live events and where it could be tricky, uh, we also have the family live event included, um, which like covers the scope of everything you needed to do from your home life, essentially. So both register if you have a newborn child, but also uh, register yourself if you uh, retire. Um, so it's quite a broad spectrum that we should that we needed to have a mystery shopper from if you want to cover all those cases. Um, especially if you also add up studying um, or business startup in which you need to uh, create a business or register yourself as a new business. Um, covering all those separate domains as actual users would be quite more involved. Um, then we have the scope for now to do, unfortunately. But also it's from our end, um, not so much about completing the service as such, um, but just about, okay, are you able to access it? Are you able to find it? Are you able to get the information about how the, the service works? So from that end, we can get quite uh, good results from uh, with the methodology we use right now. To provide I'm, some I'm of, asking yeah. this because to me it seems important that you recruit people that are on the level, intellectual, uh, state of mind, whatever, of the people who, de who will use these services. Because it's easier, of course, for a well-trained and informed mystery shopper um, to, to conclude something then for someone who is blind or who is uh his literacy is low who can barely read and those people exist as well and they also have to be taken into account yeah. yes no certainly um 
to also get back on the point of accessibility and for people uh, who are blind or have disability problems, um, which was also one of your early questions. That's one of the pilots we are now trying or looking into trying out this year for the new methodology, but it's not uh, implemented yet or set in stone that we're going to implement that. But I also think, um, lit, like, uh, how do you call it, literary level uh, no, would also be interesting. Yeah, I don't know. That would also certainly be interesting. Uh, but on our end, it's also relevant to have the results comparable. But it's always a balance on our end between having the results comparable between different countries and um, yeah, having a full scope of everything we evaluate. Ah, yes, yes. To... But then you should do it in every country, I guess. So to add on the literacy, uh, we also looked into this uh, with regard to the last methodology update. So in many countries, you see that governments are aware that uh, they have to use quite simple language to their citizens to make uh, text easily understandable. And uh, for example, some of the Dutch government websites are, are already focusing on this. Uh, however, it's quite hard to measure this, we found out. So um, we could do a language check on simplicity for English, but it gets very complicated, very fast to uh, compare the complexity of the Dutch language with the complexity of, let's say, the Greek language, which even has another alphabet. So the, the, this is sort of um, a consideration between what is uh interesting and important and then um well how to make services um understandable for your citizens is very important but also can you make it work and that is quite hard for well the example mentioned thanks and i i am now a bit maybe sounding critical but uh <laughs> i know it's a huge challenge and uh but yeah yeah, no problem. Uh, they were, they were very good questions. <laughs> you were making me think, guys, as you were discussing with us, that the it's a problem we also have on our side. We we are probably even one step before that. If we at the European Data Portal, when we measure the maturity of open data publishing by the member states, we cannot even afford doing mystery sh uh, shopper-like experiments. For example, we cannot take a data scientist who tries to build exactly the same application in every country out of the data available from that country. That would be an amazing experiment to run. I, imagine that uh, the same a data scientist in every country needs to develop, say, the same uh, weather app and check if the data is available, uh, if the documentation is good enough, uh, how long it will take to do it, how much interaction they need to have with the civil service to get what they need. That would be an amazing experiment, but can you imagine how expensive that would be? Oh, uh, I think it's okay. If you run a usability study, and this is what you do in a way, it's you select uh, 30 people, one in every country, and you give them this task and you give them uh, some time. And okay, to do this every year, it's impossible, I guess. But it could be a nice experiment. You have okay, good so. ideas. <laughs> I take your word, and I see Daniele and Ilka uh, are listening, so let's take a note of this. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the good questions. Um, and also definitely good for something for us to keep into considera consideration going forward. Um, I'm also mindful of time and still want to open the floor if others have more questions. Otherwise, I'm just happy to jump in with another one. Okay, then my question... I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Elina, go ahead. Uh, my question was going to be based on the insights and the responses that you receive every year. How do you make actionable recommendations and next steps for the countries to continue improving? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, we actually have one part in our report that is called um, Bench Learning. And here we try to group countries to a number of um, characteristics that might be interesting. So, for example, we look at the level of digital skills in a country that is data available by uh, the Digital Economy and Society Index. And we see so countries with uh, similar digital skills score uh, this well on our research. 
and uh, what are they doing well or uh, what are comparable countries in uh, that group doing so we make different groupings and say okay you belong in this group uh, based on these characteristics and um, we see that you are a top performer in that group or uh, perhaps you're a little bit lagging behind and it makes it interesting because then uh, countries can truly learn from other countries that are quite similar to them so to give an uh well let's say uh, malta and germany are not that similar whereas uh, estonia and lithuania can learn quite a lot from each other because they are already quite uh, similar also quite interesting to mention is that one of the things that we uh, also use to group is uh the open data indicator of the uh, digital economy and society index. So we also tend to try to group um, the countries based on their use of open data and see how that um, enables or improves their e-government. Okay, follow up question. And to add, I can add a bit, little bit more into that uh, because this is all very uh, data driven um uh, but like that's not the whole story like we if we say to a country you can improve by 10 points they're like okay sure how um so what we also include in most of our reports and we have two reports one is the insight report which really focuses on okay the global levels what do we see happening and what are the big trends but also the background reports where there's also room for good practices so we asked the member states, okay, what's something you have developed within your country in the last year or the last two years um, that has progressed your e-government state of play? Um, and we include those in the background reports so that they also have practical or a little bit more tangible assets or ideas. Okay, I need to improve 10 points. Maybe I could take a lesson from Cyprus or from Poland or name a country. Yes, yes. And uh, to add a little bit on that, we, we group those good practices. So, for example, uh, Portugal starts a, a new portal to start up your business. Then you can specifically look up um, starting a business and then you see, okay, Portugal has recently done this with some success. Uh, and then governments can try to sort of copy or at least use uh, one uh, the, the methodology that has been used before by, well, in this example, Portugal. Follow-up question on my side is, um, you were saying that you group countries that have similar scoring or similar strength to one another. What happens if, um, how do you do, because for example, looking back again at the European data portal in our ODM, we have four dimensions and you guys have three dimensions. What, how do you group them when there is high discrepancy along these if there is high discrepancy along these three dimensions do you group them with one with some that are higher in terms of the digital single market or in user empowerment or do you find that if one is good in one they're usually not too far behind on the others so, yeah, that'd be very awesome <laughs> yeah but i think our our data set is a little bit too limited to do those specific types of analyses for now, we mainly check against the e-government score as a whole uh, compared to different um, indicators we collect from open data. For example, the open data um, maturity assessment. Um, so we just give a more overall uh, evaluation. Okay, considering the context variables we have, are you underperforming or performing as expected or overperforming? Um, unfortunately, not yet at the level of, like we can say, you're underperforming in your usability or mobile friendliness. That's no, level. Exactly. So we use the entire score. So the scores you see on this uh, slide. And we also compare them with uh, another um, data point from Eurostat, and that's called uh, penetration. So what we measure is how good is e-government if you want to use it? Um, the penetration indicator, which we also use, measures, say, um, how often is e-government used? So in a number of countries, we see that they actually have quite good e-government available, but that the use of e-government lags behind. Um, 
And that perhaps could be a reason. So that's one of the things we see in our report that uh, digital skills are lagging behind. And then you can still have good e-government, uh, but without the digital skills, it uh, will not be used that often. So that are the sorts of insights that you can get out of uh, that part of the analysis. And it also works both ways around. Uh, ask another question if you want, but or, otherwise Jochem and I can bounce around all the time. Um, I was going to give, also... oh, yeah. give Ray the floor for her question because I also cut her off to ask mine. I can give this quote in one, uh, in one sentence. Um, the penetration and use of e-government also is related to how good e-government is. Uh, we have examples of services that have been put online, uh, but were used so infrequently that they were put offline again. Uh, so it's also one hand feeds the other. Um, yeah, maybe as a final uh, final question following you, Elina. Um... Are you aware of any limits to your research? Yes, so that sort of aligns with uh, rules points. And I think also uh, with the question of else earlier. So first of all, um, does anything need to be online? So the example rule mentioned is about uh, starting a small claim procedure, which was taken offline. But you can also think of services uh, which we measure such as debt counseling. So people who are in debt might want to make an online appointment. Uh, but there's also something to say to keep that service uh, not digital because it's quite important to have the uh, human connection. Uh, another point is indeed, uh, so let's say uh, accessibility or different people trying to obtain a service. Uh, it's quite hard to get a full sample of um, everyone who wants to use the service and to also represent uh, all those different people that you can meet in Europe to represent all of those in our research. So I would say those are two important limits. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah if I can add on that, um, one other tricky thing also in our workshops and discussions we quite often have is not all services that you and I or other Europeans need to use are provided by public administrations, um, SEC that we evaluate or that um, are the main use of the, the results. Um, so for example, if uh, you we have a studying life event, a lot of those services are provided by universities, uh, which all have their own service providers who all have their own uh, methodologies, technologies. Um, but they do are they are very relevant to students in public life or in uh, the services they need to use. Um, so that's a difficult balance between what exactly can we uh, can our readers and users influence, uh, and don't we bunch up too much stuff from different uh, companies or administrations? Uh, so it's difficult to keep a clear picture of, of what we are. Of, effectively evaluating and what can effectively be influenced by the results. Okay, I think that's also a nice uh, way to end this unless there's more questions from the audience. We do have time for one more or a more uh, or another closing remark from Rule or Jochem on something they think um, they might have missed or that we neglected to ask or that they want to elaborate on before we close <laughs> you're very welcome else yeah uh thank you very much for your time um our main goal with the e-government benchmark is eventually to encourage learning between different countries or government service providers um if please take a look at our reports or anything we've presented so far and if you have suggestions for the next couple of uh, evaluations that we could implement please let us know um, you at least have the contact of uh, Elina, I guess, or uh, other people from the Open Data Portal, European Data Portal, and that will reach us eventually. Uh, so please, uh, if you have any suggestions, let us know. Yeah, so also from my side, uh, a big thanks for having us. A uh, big thanks for all the good questions and discussion. And um, yeah, if you have any additional questions, you know how to find us. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for that. And also a big thanks for, um, from us on behalf of the EDP and SCDS team for joining us and sharing these insights. And we look forward to continuing um, this conversation offline and also going forward in the future. Maybe invite you again next year to have a continuation on the next iteration or the eGovernment Benchmark 2021. <laughs> I think we would certainly like that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Then have a great afternoon, everyone, and have, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Everyone. Thank you.